I'd like to welcome you to the Warren Seminar. Uh, for this week, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, present uh, Professor Benson Shing. Benson is at the University of California, San Diego, where he is professor and uh, chair of the department. He's been there for, oh, about 20 years, Benson? Something like that? 12 years, yeah. Oh, 12 years, okay. Prior to that, he was at the University of Colorado, Boulder. He did his uh, graduate work at the University of California, Berkeley. And at Boulder, he did some really seminal work on the performance of masonry shear walls, uh, which to this day are the basis of a lot of what we do in the uh, seismic design of masonry systems. But he's also done incredible work in uh, fast pseudodynamic testing, developing one of the first algorithms. And he's moved on to hybrid testing with substructuring. And at the University of California, San Diego, he has worked extensively on developing uh, high fidelity, finite element models and testing to validate those models on their giant shake table. I won't say any more about that uh, to make sure that he, not to take away any of his thunder. I've known Benson for many years um, and uh, he's a good friend uh, as well as a colleague and I had the good fortune of being on his team in a recent NSF project funded out of the NIST program on partially grouted masonry. Uh, Kath Catherine uh, Johnson has been working on the test here, uh, and uh, Benson was the, uh, the lead PI in this program. Well, without any more ado, uh, please give a warm welcome to Professor Shing. Thank you very much, Professor Schultz, for your kind invitation and very kind introduction. Now, today I would like to share with you some of the research <laughs> some of the past research project uh, I've been involved with related to reinforced concrete and masonry structures. Now, as you know, how many of you have experienced earthquakes before? Many, some of you, right? So you know earthquake in the past course, actually I experienced my first earthquake the first day I arrived at Berkeley when I was an undergraduate student. I got woken up at midnight, and the whole room was shaking and rattling. At that time, I didn't know what earthquake was. So I thought it was a, some kind of tornadoes outside. <laughs> and then everybody rushed out of the building, so I just followed them. So actually, the largest earthquake in California in recent years, one of the largest is the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake that was just a few years I left California, so I didn't have a chance to experience that. It caused a lot of damage in bridge structures. And also, of course, followed by the 94 Norwich earthquakes, which caused, again, damage on bridge structures and buildings. So we know that earthquake is very <laughs> destructive. Now, of course, the best way to develop methods to improve the performance of structures in earthquakes is through experimental research as well as computational modeling. You know, in Minnesota, you have outstanding experimental facilities for that purpose, and you have many distinguished experimentalists and modelers working on this subject area as well. Now, of course, the behavior of a structure in the earthquake is extremely complicated because it could cause large damage, like the fracture of the concrete, crushing of the concrete, fracture of the reinforcements, and the interaction of, say, concrete and masonry with steel reinforcement. So really, experimental testing is the best way to understand such behavior and also to calibrate our analytical models. Now, computational simulation is becoming more, more important in this area because it offers a number of <coughs> benefits. First of all, large-scale experiment is very costly. So to do such a test, we have to be very careful. If we waste a specimen, it could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if you have ability, say, to do some pre-test pre simulation, we can better design the test, and also we may need less number of tests to achieve what we want. And also, those models sometimes shed some new light into the performance of structure, some of the behavior of the structures, like the local mechanism, the distribution of forces in different structural elements, they're generally very difficult to measure with 
the experimental setup. So sometimes computational model can enhance our understanding. And also, once calibrated, this model can be used for parametric studies, then we can develop more data to develop our design specifications and also provides us some assessment tools. Now, in addition, this kind of modeling, nonlinear modeling, become more and more important with performance-based earthquake engineering. Now, the, it relies very much on nonlinear modeling, especially for the development of co-provisions using performance-based approach. And we often have to simulate a structure to its collapse state. So it becomes now very heavily utilized. So today I just want to share some of the research project we involved with testing and also modeling. Now one project I want to talk about is related to the anchorage of column bars in enlarged power shafts. Now this kind of construction is very common California, so essentially we have a reinforced concrete column sitting on an enlarged shaft. This is called type 2 shaft. It has many advantages. One is for earthquake performance standpoint because in the Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation specification, we want plastic deformation to be focused on in the column elements, okay, not in the superstructure. So if we have an enlarged shaft, then we can localize the damage at the base of the column rather than inside the shaft underneath the soil surface. So that way it's easier for post-earthquake inspection of the damage and also for repair purpose. And also enlarged shaft is more forgiving in the construction. So you make room for some say alignment issues when you put a column on the pile. So since the power is larger, so sometimes the column can be shipped a little bit. Okay? It's more forgiving also. So, but this also introduced some issues is as how deep the column longitudinal reinforcement should be anchored inside the shaft to prevent a failure like this, the pull out failure. Now in the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, there were column collapses related to this kind of failure. So, Caltrans design specifications become very conservative. Now, prior to 2010, the embedment length requirements of the flooring, okay, actually the reinforcement had to be terminated in staggered way in two stages. So LE1 is the first stage and LE2 is the second stage. So that is a requirement uh, with the perception that there will be some damage occurring in that region, so terminating all the bars all at once will not be safe. Now, for the first stage is two times the maximum dimension of the column, and the second is three times the dimension of the column. Now, for large bridge structures, this kind of column can be easily six foot to nine foot in diameter. So if you have a large column like nine foot in diameter, three times D, C max, will be 27 feet. So that is a lot of work to go to that deep below the surface and also the OSHA requirement will kick in once you have workers working in the confined space 20 feet below the surface. So that makes the construction very expensive. So Caltrans realized that in 2010, they revised the provision to reduce their embedment length. So they changed that to D plus LD and D plus two times LD. LD is the development length according to the ash code. code. Okay? So that slightly reduced that, but they did not have much experimental data to support that. They just, they felt that it is conservative. Okay? So that's why they asked to do a research project to study the anchorage behavior of this <laughs> type of construction and try to derive an improved design specification for that. Okay? And also I must mention that the LD, according to Ashto, okay, were really not proven for large diameter bars used in those large bridge columns like number 14 and number 18 bars. Okay? And also most of the 
provisions in the code based on really monotonic pull-out tests rather than cyclic testing. So it's not really sure that those bars could, the development length is sufficient for those bars to develop the full tensile strength. So to address this problem, we did a <coughs> series of testing from small scale to large scale. So we start from bond slip tests, okay, focusing on large diameter bars number 11, 14, and 18 to get the basic bond slip characteristics of those bars. So most of those provisions were based on number eight bar tests. And then we did some development tests. We built a, say, a <coughs> column specimen with a single bar inside. We exert pull and push flow on it to see where the development length specified in the H2 code is appropriate or not. And then finally, we did a full-scale column power assembly test, okay? So model the situation of actual column power assembly to see whether the current provision is over conservative and how much we can reduce the embedment length of the column bars inside the shaft. So these studies, experiment tests were <coughs> supplemented by computational modeling, and actually it really helped a lot, so it helped us to decide what the design of those test specimens. So it's very expensive to do each test, so we, only can, we could only afford to do four specimens. So we really have to pin down the re design <coughs> requirements with only small specimens. So without computational modeling, that would be very difficult to achieve. So now, the anchorage is very much related to the bond slip mechanism of deformed bars. So this just introduced the <coughs> physical mechanism of bond slip. Imagine that you have a bar embedded in concrete, and the bar is pulled in this direction. Okay? And normally, the resistance to the slip is provided by first some adhesive force between the steel and the concrete. And then the bearing resistance is the bearing of the concrete against the bar ribs, and also the frictional resistance. Okay? And, and the bar is pulled, it could cause crushing and shearing of the concrete in this region, okay? and sometimes also introduce some transverse cracks like this. And of course, due to the wedging action of the bar ribs, it could cause tensile splitting cracks like this, radiating from the bar, and this normally suppressed by putting confinement in the column. So we have the tensile hoops here to exert the confining stress to prevent splitting. Otherwise, the bar will get pulled out with tensile splitting failure. So that is not really desirable. So this just shows the bond stress, bond slip relation here. If we have lightly confined concrete, then normally the failure is the splitting crack like this, so it's very weak. It's well confined, then it involves the crushing failure in the concrete. Sometimes the whole bar will, the bar failure will be governed by the crushing of the concrete between the bar ribs, and then it will develop a sliding surface along here. Okay? So to Characterize the bond slip behavior of large diameter bars, we did 22 tests on bar number 8, 11, 14, and 18 bars. Okay, so each specimen is like a concrete cylinder with three foot in diameter. And then this is the bond length of the bar, and this is just unbonded area to mitigate the stress transferred from the reaction forces okay, into the bond. So this shows a test setup, and we did a number of tests with different bar with different load history, like monotonically increasing load, cyclic loading, some fully reverse cycles, and some just cycle in one direction and a little bit in the other direction. So we look at the uh, inference of the, also the load history on the bond slip behavior. So now we use this test to calibrate a semi-empirical 
bond slip law. Actually, in this project, we there are two laws. One is a more plasticity-based law. The other is a semi-empirical law, which is far more efficient and can be used in the large-scale analysis. Now, in this law, it's very simple. It's an extension of the work of some other investigators, okay? starting with Elliot Housen. He proposed the original form of this model. Now, in this model, we divide the bond resistance into two parts. One is the bearing resistance, and one is the friction resistance. So some of the two give us our total bond resistance. Okay? And the beauty of this model is that it's very simple, and it only requires three physical parameters to calibrate. One is the <coughs> uh, sh bond shear resistance, the maximum bond shear resistance, and the second is the slip of the bar when reaching this peak resistance, and the other is the point at which all the bearing resistance will be drop to zero. Now, essentially, these are physically related. For example, the maximum bond resistance can be related to the concrete strength, and the slip at the peak related to the bar diameter, and this point is essentially the rib spacing of the bar. So this only three, these only three parameters, you can calibrate that. And also, it has an empirical law to account for the effect of bar yielding on the bond resistance. So that is based on the test of Schimmer and <coughs> his co-workers. So essentially, when the strain in the steel increase beyond yield, then the bond resistance will drop in this manner. So that is also accounted for in the model. Okay? So we implement this model in a zero thickness bond slip law in the abacus program. So this just shows the interface. Actually, it's a zero thickness interface. Okay? So in this model, the bond stress is equal to the product of these two. This is the relation between the bond slip, <coughs> okay, between the slip and the stress, and also the inference of the steel, and the other parameters accounts for the beta parameters account for the opening, the gap, separation between the concrete and the bar as the bar slip because of the wedging action of the bar ribs. So that will also weaken the bond. Okay? So we also have a cyclic law. I think I skipped that slide, so I'll come back to it. So this is the cyclic bond slip law we introduced. It accounts for the bar degradation under cyclic loading. So essentially, there are two damage parameters, D, uh, F, and DB. So this re is related to the degradation of bond strength provided by friction. And this is the degradation of the bond strength provided by the bearing force. So now, after implementing this, we can validate with the bond slip test data we obtain for large diameter bars as well as the test data of other investigators. So we can see that uh, with these tests with different low histories, okay, with different bar sizes, so the model actually worked quite well, looking at the local bond stress bond slip behavior. Then the next test uh, we did was on the developmenting test, so we have a long development length okay, for the bars, embedment length. And this embed, we test three specimens uh, for number 14 and also for number 18 bars. They are very large. Now, essentially, we want to evaluate whether the provision provided by the ash tocos on the development length is appropriate. Okay? So the third test specimen, we reduce this development length to 60% of what is required in the ash toe. And this is calculated based on the nominal string of the bar, 60 KSI, and the actual string of the concrete we are using. Okay? And this is development length is based on the basic development length provided by ASHTO times a 0.6 factor, which accounted for the situation that is well confined. 
So I just show you one test. It the, was the first test on the number 14 bars. Okay? And actually, the concrete strain in that specimen did not reach our target strain of 5 KSI. It only reached 4.2. So somehow the concrete was weaker for some reason. Now, you see that we subject to tension, and then we unload it and subject to some compression, and then we subject this bar to a number of cycles. So interestingly, eventually, what we observed in the test was a bar pull-out failure you can see in this picture. Okay? So all the concrete between the bar ribs were crushed, and the whole bar was pulled out of the, because of this crushing failure. Okay? So actually, the in that case, the development length was not sufficient to develop the full tensile strength of the bar. So this can be attributed to the fact that this concrete did not reach 5,000 KSI. Okay? So this shows that the H2 recommendation actually is really does not provide the sufficient reliability to develop the full tensile strength. So that's what we have found. We also did a large number of numerical study with Monte Carlo simulation to show that the reliability index for the ASHTO is really lower than what we would like to have. Okay. So we validate this with our final element model. You can see that this final element model can predict that. And the accounting for the yielding of the bar is also very important here. If we do not account for the yielding of the bar, okay, the really, <coughs> we will reach this point rather than we will reach the pull out failure. So it will be failed by bar rupture instead. So you can see that yielding will, is a very important factor. This also shows the, the strength developed along the bar, okay, along the depth of the abatement length. You can see the model also capture the experimentally measured strain relatively well, okay, considering this is a cyclic testing. So finally, with this model, we did some numerical studies, and with our numerical result, we designed four test specimens, okay? This, sorry, uh, the full-scale specimens, so you can see that this <laughs> Specimen, actually, in all those specimens, we terminate all the column reinforcement at one point. We didn't use a staggered approach because the analysis showed that that's sufficient. So this the, shows the design of four specimens. Okay? This shows the embedment length used. They vary the embedment length. And also there's variation as to the quantity of the transfer reinforcement in the shaft which is very critical because without appropriate confinement, we could have splitting failure of the bond and have premature anchorage failure that developed. Okay? Now, in the first specimens, we use actually is a requirement close to the minimum required by Caltrans is essentially the diameter of a column plus the LD specified in ASHTO. Okay? The other is what we recommend based on the, some other studies and also numerical simulation is essentially much lower than this one. It is the ASHTO development length plus S. S is the spacing of the longitudinal bars in the shaft and in the column. And C is just the concrete cover here. So this is based on the trust analogy. Okay. So the variation of the confinement, we use different specification, one is the minimum required by ASHTO for compression members. The second one we, for assessment is uh, proposed by McLean and Smith. Actually, th this recommendation has been currently adopted by ASHTO. Actually, ASHTO is interestingly used half of a man recommended in that study. Okay? So we use what is recommended by McLean and Smith. So, and the last two specimens, we use the confinement reinforcement uh, based on the formula we propose in this study, and this case is really provide the minimum okay, uh, to prevent the splitting failure, and this one is the, is the reinforcement required 
to control the crack width introduced by the tensile splitting due to bond slip. So what I show you is test number two, the second specimen, okay, which used the embedment length we recommend and also the confinement recommended by McLean and Smith. So the whole purpose, of course, we want to have sufficient development length so the plastic hinges will be concentrated at the base of the column with minimum damage in the shaft. And you can see that it indeed achieved that purpose. So we have severe crushing of the concrete and buckling of those longitudinal reinforcement. But however, we also now start to see cracks developing in the shaft. You see these longitudinal cracks. That is the tensile splitting cracks because of the bar slip. But these cracks were controlled by the confining steel, the hoops inside the shaft. And also, we see some of the cracking develop here. So a block of concrete was start to pull out. So a lot of damage occurred in this region. But the bond, but the embedment length seems to be sufficient to develop the full tensile capacity of the reinforcement to buckling and fracture. Actually, a number of bar fractures, you could see that the drop of flow here uh, due to the rupture of the bars. So we did the <coughs> D final element modeling using the Abacus program. We implement our bond slip law there. So we can see that we can mimic the behavior very well. Okay? And one thing we did not capture is the low degradations and also the wretch of the bar because in Abacus, the steel model there is not able to account for the <laughs> bar fracture, okay? So this shows more detailed comparisons between the test and the final element analysis. This shows the strain in the column, longitudinal reinforcement. So above zero is in the column, okay? This is the column reinforcement. And negative depth means it is the reinforcement embedded inside the shaft. So this is, such, remember this is the data obtained from cyclic loading. So there are two ductility level we compare. One is a ductility of two, the other is 6.9. So at ductility of two, I think the comparison is very good. Then the data start to have deviation when they have ductility 6.9, when the column was subject to a quite a large number of cycles. But this is a cyclic test, so it's very difficult to match exactly. But beyond 6.9, all our strain gauges were damaged, so we had no data to compare. Now, this is something we obtained from the model. We could not obtain from the test. This is the bar stress along the depth. Okay, so I'm sorry, it's a bond stress along the depth. Okay? You can see two situations. The gray shows the fertility of 3, and this shows the fertility of 6.9. Okay? So in this comparison, you can see the gradual bond degradation of along the bar near the interface between the column and the shaft. So initially, we have this bond stress distribution. So after a number of cycles, the stress here drop because of plastic string penetration into the shaft and as a result of the bond degradation. Okay. So more of these tests, we found the plastic string <laughs> degradation around maybe 10 times the bar diameter. So this shows the slip of the bar okay, inside the shaft, and this shows the comparison of the measured stress in the confining hoops okay, as compared to what predict with the numerical model, which seems to be pretty good. So after that, we use that to do a number of <laughs> simulation parametric studies, we want to know what is the minimum that's required, okay? So whether we want to confirm whether what we use in the test is indeed the minimum or can we further reduce that. So for example, in this case, we did some comparison, okay? This is what we recommend and use in the test specimen, and we 
have a much reduced embedment length, which is like 65% of the recommend by <laughs> ESHTO. So you could see that in that reduced development length, we end up with a bomb failure. The stress suddenly dropped to zero after a number of cycles. So you could see there's a distinct difference in the load displacement relation. So based on the large number of simulations, we confirmed that this is a pretty <coughs> good recommendation as the minimum embedment, ring, re, embedment length required. And we recommend this, this simplified design formula to determine the embedment length. So instead of, in this formula, instead of using what is recommended in H to LD, we propose this because we find that actually the LD recommend the H to does not have the sufficient reliability to develop full tensile strain considering the uncertainties in the material properties and in construction. Okay? So this is a more appropriate formula to develop that. So as a comparison, if we use our recommendation, if we compare what is used in 2010 requirement of Caltrans, you can see the reduction is quite significant in the embedment length. Okay? If you look at especially as the size of the column increases. So another project also related to bridge structures I want to <laughs> share with you is, is the shear keys in bridge <coughs> abutments. Okay? So this shows a typical bridge abutments. Okay? We have the wing walls okay, surrounding the soil, and we have the back wall, and then we have the stand wall. In, on top of stand wall, there are shear keys. So the main function of the shear keys is to restrain the motion of the bridge track, say, during the construction time when the deck is being <laughs> post-tensioned, and also prevent the movement of the deck during small and moderate earthquakes. But these shear keys are also intended to serve as structural fields, because in the large earthquake, they want the keys to fail instead of transmitting the seismic load to the piles. So if the piles are damaged, then the repair could be very expensive, very difficult. So they want to use the shear keys as a fuse to prevent the transmission of severe seismic force to the piles. Okay? Now, the conventional design is non-isolated shear keys, so shear keys are monolithic with the stand walls. Okay? And, but However, with that kind of design, very often, okay, from past studies, okay, also conducted at UCSD before with for Caltrans, most of failure will be occurring in the stand walls. So a diagonal crack like this. So these kind of cracks are not very desirable because it's very difficult to repair and expensive to repair. Okay? So one alternative that came up is to use isolated shear keys. So that means to introduce a construction joint okay, with the bonding agents there so that the shear keys can slide along the top of the stand wall. But there's also an issue here. And is actually there are two camps in Caltrans they're arguing. Okay? Because the, those against this is this is expensive to construct. If you introduce a construction joint, then the construction <coughs> people have to cast this in two stages and prepare this surface. So that will increase the cost of the construction. So one idea came up is, is how do we design, say, a monolithic shear key so that we will have a failure more or less like this. So that will satisfy both camps. Okay? So that so, and currently, there are really no design provisions guidelines in Caltrans design specifications. So the idea of this project is to get a better understanding of the behavior and also develop some design formula which can be used to accurately predict the capacity of these shear keys and able to develop, say, styling shear failure with the monolithic construction. So this shows the reinforcement details okay, of uh, shear keys on the stand wall. So these are the stand wall shear reinforcements. So these are the main reinforcement control the 
cracking of the stem wall, especially the diagonal crack. Okay, and these uh, reinforcement attach the shear key, connect the shear key to the stem wall. Okay, so the capacity of the shear key, the sliding capacity is very much controlled by the, the quantity of this reinforcement. So we test quite a number of shear key specimen. They are not full scale. They are forty percent scale. Okay. We test some isolated <laughs> shear keys, monolithic shear keys, okay, and actually also monolithic shear keys in a skewed bridge abutment. We have a 60 degree skew that is the maximum expected in real bridges. And finally, we look at the more, uh, I would say, <laughs> uh, innovative design is looking at a concept of called post tension shear key never been used before. The idea is to let the shear keys to rock instead of having fracture and sliding. So I just show you a test of a monolithic shear key okay, that we achieved with, together with Caltrans engineer, we developed a design which could achieve the sliding failure instead of a diagonal crack propagating with that. You can see also the behavior of shear key is rather brittle. So that is one really issue, it's a challenge in the seismic design. Okay? It's a very brittle element. So this shows the final damage. Now, the sliding resistance of shear keys contribute by a number of different <coughs> mechanisms. Okay? One, of course, is the frictional resistance. Okay? Frictional resistance is also enhanced by the vertical reinforcement. If this is a rough surface, when it slides, the joint will expand. And then the vertical reinforcement will exert a clamping force that will enhance the frictional resistance of the shear keys. Of course, there's cohesive force in the concrete before cracking. And also <coughs> the dowel force provided by the vertical rebound. Okay? Actually, uh, for monolithic shear key, cohesive resistance provides a significant portion of that, and followed by friction, and then some by the dial force. But however, when the shear key slide a lot, this bar will be develop a significant kink, and will be, assume an inclined position, so that will also exert some diagonal tension, so that will also provide a lot of resistance to the shear keys. So we developed some modeling to try to capture the behavior of the shear key. One essential component is to look at the dowel behavior. So this just illustrates the dowel action, says this is a vertical reinforcement. When the two blocks of concrete slide relative to each other, compressive force will be developed from the concrete against the steel bar, and this developed the dowel force. So in this dial model, we implement that in a final enron program. Again, we use Abacus for our simulation. So this is a dial law by Brenner. Okay, it's based on monotonically increasing loading. So it's essentially an empirical formula calibrated against the test data. So all these parameters here are based on the string of the concrete. So the model depends on the concrete string as well as on the bar diameter. Okay? We find that this model compared with test data is quite reliable. We implement this DAO in a zero thickness interface law. Now, to model DAO, in fact, there can be a number of ways to do it, right? You can really model a very detailed 3D finite element model, model the interaction of the bar with the concrete, okay? But doing that computationally is very inefficient, okay? You need very fine mesh. For example, we look at this. This is just based on the simple model study, looking at the sensitivity of the dial behavior on the mesh size. You can see the solution start to converge when the element size, the length of the bar, is one half of the bar diameter. So you can see that how refined a mesh that's required to model this very accurately. So really, a detailed food 3D finite element model is not a viable approach from the computational efficiency standpoint. So we use 
try to model the behavior of the dial in the interface. The interaction force between the concrete and the steel is all modeled in this interface using the law provided by Brenner. Okay? And also, in order to further enhance the efficiency, we develop a special interface element that allows the size of the bars to be different from the size of the concrete. That means we can use much smaller bar, smaller bar elements as compared to the concrete element. The small bar elements will be required to model the dial behavior appropriately, while the failure behavior of concrete can be represented by a, by a much coarser mesh. So essentially, we develop this element and the interaction of the bar, this is the bar side, this is the concrete side, will be based on really the tributary area, tributary length of this bar. So we validate this model with a lot of test data, like monotonic dial test, dial bar test, and also cyclic tests. So and then <laughs> we also implement a <coughs> cohesive interface surface to model the sliding the to model the sliding of the shear key okay, through the construction joint or also through a cracked interface so this model is actually extension of a 2d model developed previously by my student and myself so now we expand this to sorry to a <coughs> zero thickness 2D interface. And the failure is governed by a hyperboloid. Okay? So we have this, this shows the shear resistance, and this is a normal stress. So this governs the mixed mode fracture condition of that interface. So now, this shows a comparison of the model with our test, so we could capture this relatively well and also the failure behavior of the shear keys. Okay. So based on this model, we did a lot of, again, numerical study, especially for skewed shear keys. So we look at the influence of the skew angle on the resistance of the shear keys, and based on that, we can develop a simplified design recommendation. So I'm not going to design recommendation because there's could be another <coughs> hour talk on this. So next, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. We move from our campus laboratory testing to an off-site facilities, which is the outdoor shake table. Okay? This is at the Inglecrest Center, which is about 10 miles east from our campus. This is an outdoor shake table, 25 by 40 foot in dimension. Okay? This is part of the NS program NARI. We test in the past a three-story concrete, non-ductile concrete frame with unreinforced masonry. That is really a very challenging topic because currently we do not have good ways to predict the capacity and the performance of this structure. So this shows the very last test of a frame, modeling a 1930 construction in California, non-ductile concrete frame with brick infill. So we test it to the collapse. <laughs> and also we develop some nonlinear models. So this is really the, <coughs> uh, a model similar to what I present before on the shear key analysis, the interface model for cohesive crack. <coughs> now in brick masonry, the behavior of the mortar joint is a major component. Okay? So when, say, the masonry is subject to shearing, sometimes uh, cracks could occur at the interface between the mortar and the brick, and sometimes those cracks actually could cross the mortar joint, okay? And if we subject it to cycle, the shear stress versus shear displacement relation typically look like this. It's very similar to the behavior of concrete or rocks subject to shear. We start with some cohesive force, and the co fracture occurred, the cohesive will be lost, and then essentially by friction. And then also we can have some joint, be 
displacement in the normal direction of the joint. Okay, so when we slide this, sometimes this normal displacement could increase. This is what we call joint dilatation. Joint dilatation is due to the roughness of the joint. When you slide, say, on the rough surface, the, the roughness will the aggregates, for example, in the concrete or the roughness in the fracture joint will force this joint to open. So this is a dilatation. But after a few cycles, also we can observe a phenomenon that the joint will have a compression behavior, mainly because of the damage of the material. The loss of material will cause the compression. So we develop an interface model which can capture this behavior. It's a very simple interface model, capture this shear and joint dilatation, and also tensile crack opening and closing behavior in a very simple way. And in this model, it's a really it's an elastic plastic formulation. So we have an elastic component. We have a plastic component which account for shear sliding, crack opening, and also joint compaction, and a geometric component which account for the joint dilatation. So I will just quickly go through, I'm not going to elaborate on that. This is the failure surface we used to control the mixed small failure, the tensile and the shear failure of the joint. And this is a softening law which governs the shape of this surface. And we model <laughs> a very simple elastic modified elastic plastic formulation to model the shear sliding and also crack opening and closing. And this is the plastic flow rule used to model the joint compaction behavior when it's subject when the joint is subject to a compressive stress. And under tension, crack opening, we use a modified flow rule. It's very similar to a re stress return law. Now, shear dilatation is a geometric phenomenon. So we account for this using this simple geometric expression. So the dilatation is related to the joint, the sliding along the joint. So we validated with testing like a, a single bay infill frame test, so some tests conducted in Colorado, which this is based on the prior <coughs> research project in collaboration with University of Colorado, also Stanford University. So we can capture the low versus drift ratio quite well, and this is a case of so a specimen with a window opening. So finally, we apply this to the three-story frame we test. So that was uh, right before the collapse, collapse run. So you see the cracks develop here, cracks around the window opening. So we could capture this crack pattern relatively well. So another project is the last one I would like to talk about in detail. It's a project on reinforced masonry shear wall study sponsored by <coughs> NIST <coughs> several years ago. So it's a collaboration between the University of Texas at Austin and also Washington State University. So in this project, we look at reinforced masonry, look at the performance design of reinforced masonry structure. We test full-scale structures on the shake table, and also we have 41 quasi-static tests on wall components at the University of Texas, Austin, and also at Washington State University. And with all this, we calibrate a computational model to develop a general understanding how a masonry wall system will behave. So on the shake tables, we test two specimens. One is a three-story specimen designed according to current code provisions. The second one <coughs> was designed using a displacement-based approach. So we use displacement as we limit the displacement okay, as a goal in the design process. So this is approach becoming more and more popular nowadays. So I would now just focus on that two-story building Okay, designed using the displacement-based approach. 
design was done at Texas Austin, okay? Actually, base design criteria based very much on the wall component test with shear dominated behavior in their lab. Because of these perforated wall systems, most of the failure will be shear dominated, like in these piers next to the window openings, okay? So we have to limit the drift of these individual piers. So based on these tests, you can see that the drift at the peak is about 0.5% and significant load degradation start about 1% drift. So this is, this correspond to the behavior individual peer, but if we translate into the story drift, we have to <laughs> really to be more restrictive. So we end up with this displacement criteria for our design. This is for the design earthquake, okay? We use a drift ratio about 0.3% as the limit. At the, for the maximum considered earthquake, we use 0.6% as the drift limit. And then we did some nonlinear pushover analysis, okay, to the drift level and determine what would be the base shear that would be required and also did some time history analysis to make sure the displacement will be within the limit. So this structure was subject to a series of earthquake ground motions and rise numbers, so sometimes in the shake table test, like quasi steady test, we often over test the structure because we want to get as much data as possible, okay? But however, the main damage occur in the last two run, actually, at this run and this run. Okay, actually this run correspond to the design and maximum considered earthquake somewhere in between. The very last one correspond to the maximum considered earthquake. You could see that initially this is the structural period. At this stage, there is a small change in the period. <coughs> it is a small period elongation because of some cracking and damage, but damage was very minor. But after this run, you could see a significant jump in the period because of significant damage developed in the wall system. And this was a very final run, okay? So I just show you the test. see those shear cracks developed in those piers. <laughs> okay. So now this shows some pictures of the damage structures and show the base shear versus the drift ratio at the first story. Now, you can see that actually the structure performed as expected the design earthquake. The drift level really satisfied the design limit. But however, at the MCE level, the structure drift way more than that. And that could be attributed to the damage suffered by the structure prior to this run. Okay? And we did validate with our finite element model. We did a finite element study with an undamaged structure, and it seems to perform much better and meet this drift requirement. But in this case, the test structure, because of the prior damage, the drift in the very last run is much bigger than what we impose in design. But the amazing part is the ductility is a bit by this structure. The structure is really quite ductile, eh? considering this brittle shear behavior developed in the peers. The structure drift to close to 2%. This is quite amazing for a shear dominated wall. Okay, so this is really that. So this can be attributed to the system level behavior of the masonry. So we did some final element model. We take advantage of symmetry because it was subject to uniaxial motion. So we just model half of the structure by taking advantage of symmetry. And we show, this shows the discretization of the structure. So we use rectangular and triangular 
smear crash shell element combined with cohesive interface element like we developed for unreinforced masonry and we also model the reinforcement. So this shows the comparison of the model with the test. So we also use this model, try to understand the system level behavior of their structures. Okay? So we observe that the capacity of the structure is just way higher than one would expect if you just consider the capacity of the imprint walls. So this enhancement is due to the outer plane walls. Our plane walls somehow has a restraining effect. So when the imprint walls rock, for example, I show here, the outer plane wall will be extended and exert additional compression to it, and that will strengthen the structure a lot. So we did two pushover analysis to demonstrate that, one with the imprint wall, the other without, one with outer plane wall, the other without outer plane wall. So you could see that difference is quite significant. If you look at just the bending resistance of our plane wall, which is only 5% of the total capacity, okay? So this really concludes the last one is I just want to show for your interest. It's a partially ground wall study, okay? Actually, it's a joint project with Professor Shows here. He's testing some walls, partially ground walls in the lab here using quasi-steady testing, and we did some testing with <coughs> on the shake table. So this, I just want to say, this somehow is not automated, okay? Now I don't know how to start this <laughs> video, okay? I will show that video. Let me see, it's not running. I think we are more or less running out of time, right? Yes. So finally, I just want to Thank you. I also acknowledge all my former students who contribute significantly to this project, especially in the modeling part. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for one or two questions or comments. I guess I have a question concerning your uh, if I could call it a joint model. Yes. So you had this dilation as a function of shear displacement, I think? Correct. But I didn't see any uh, effect from normal stress, normal load. And I would think uh, dilation is very much affected by the normal stress. Correct. Now, in our, I think in the single joint examples, we put a constant normal force and we measured the dilatation, okay? But for example, like an infill wall inside a concrete frame is under confined condition. Mm -hmm. So when the joint dilates, that will increase the compressive stress on the joint and thereby increase the shear resistance. So that already accounts for in the model, but I didn't show that here okay. explicitly. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Excuse me, I have to okay. pass the microphone. I'm thinking about your bridge columns. Yes. Um, have you considered taking your calibrated model and redesigning the, um, uh, the bar system, uh, the confining system, and the central bars? Uh, In other words, designing a new system. Have uh, you considered doing that? A new system? No, we did not look at a new configuration of the reinforcement because there's not very much room we can change how these bars would be embedded. So the main thing which we can change is how much embedment length that would be required. So we mainly focus on that. So we use that model to do a number of analysis looking at different embedment length to see what is the real limit. So we also interested in how conservative this recommendation is. Uh, well, looking at your load diagrams, it seems as though um, the ribs on the bars could be larger and um, 
possibly you don't need as much of a confining system. I don't know what you think about uh, that. Confining is very important. Yeah, the, the rib of the bus more or less that satisfy the ASTM standard, the size. But however, these ribs of the bus are not totally flat, right? They have an inclined face. So when the bar tries to slip, it will exert a radial stress from the bar, pushing against the concrete. So in that case, the concrete could fail in a splitting failure. So even with very large ribs, it still could introduce a splitting failure. So we need the confinement. We find that it's yeah, quite important. Okay, excuse me. Okay, uh, thank you once again, uh, Professor Singh. And if there are any other questions, uh, Professor will be around this afternoon. All right, thank you. Thank you. Professor.